Hi, my name is Peter Thomas, President of Resource Compliance. In this short video, we'll take a deep dive into one of the most recognizable components in an ammonia refrigeration system, the high pressure receiver. In this video, we'll explore a variety of topics related to high pressure receivers. First, we'll discuss the function of a high pressure receiver within a system. Then I'll show you examples of various receiver configurations. In items three through seven in this list, we'll consider how to properly document high pressure receiver specifications within the process safety information section of a PSM program. Finally, we'll conclude by reviewing recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices for high pressure receivers. Namely, we'll highlight any unique requirements in IIAR standards two, four, and six. The purpose of a high pressure receiver is to provide a safe location to add and store high pressure liquid ammonia in a refrigeration system. Typically, the high pressure receiver receives high pressure liquid from the condensers and supplies high pressure liquid to each zone of refrigeration and recirculator. The high pressure receiver is also used to provide storage for ammonia not being used in the system at any given moment. Under normal conditions, the high pressure receiver contains high pressure liquid and vapor ammonia. There are many ways that a high pressure receiver can be configured. Often, high pressure receivers have a horizontal orientation. Horizontal receivers can be configured as through type, which means that liquid from the condenser flows through the vessel before being supplied out into the system. Alternatively, high pressure receivers can be arranged as surge type receivers. When this is the case, ammonia draining from the condensers is piped directly to the system. Ammonia will only surge into the vessel if all system loads are satisfied. High pressure receivers can also be vertically oriented. Vertical receivers offer the advantage of occupying less square footage, but a downside is that the valves on top of the vessel can be difficult to access. It is not uncommon for larger systems to have multiple high pressure receivers. When this is the case, the HPRs are typically interconnected so that they operate in concert with the same liquid level. The arrangement in this picture is quite unusual in that the two receivers are stacked on top of each other. This is a good reminder that no two systems are exactly the same. A variation of a standard high pressure receiver is the combination thermosiphon high pressure receiver. In this arrangement, the vessel has an internal chamber located near the top of the vessel. Liquid from the condensers flows into the top of the vessel and collects inside the thermosiphon chamber so that it can be supplied to the oil coolers. Overflow from the thermosiphon chamber collects at the bottom of the vessel, which serves as a standard HPR. Another variation is the controlled pressure receiver, which operates at an intermediate pressure between the compressor discharge pressure and the suction pressure. Smaller systems may be configured with what has been termed a pilot receiver. Since pilot receivers are physically small, they generally cannot hold the system in charge, and the level in the pilot receiver is maintained through the use of a float valve. The three most relevant operating limits for high pressure receivers are pressure, temperature, and liquid level. The maximum allowable working pressure of a high pressure receiver will be displayed on the ASME nameplate. Under no circumstance can the pressure inside the vessel exceed this value. The MAWP can also be found on the manufacturer data report or U1 form. Similarly, the vessel cannot operate beyond the temperatures displayed on the nameplate. In this instance, the vessel can safely operate below 300 PSI at temperatures between minus 20 and 300 degrees Fahrenheit. As with MAWP, the maximum and minimum temperatures are also displayed on the U1 form. Liquid ammonia needs room to expand if the vessel experiences an unexpected heat load. Rita Book 1 recommends that it is a good practice to limit the liquid level to no more than 80% liquid. This leaves 20% of the vessel volume as room for expansion. The 80-20 rule is based on the actual expansion change seen in anhydrous ammonia liquid that is stored at minus 65 Fahrenheit and allowed to warm up to 125 degrees Fahrenheit. When documenting the materials of construction for a high pressure receiver or any pressure vessel, the key document is the manufacturer data report. A closer look shows that the U1 form describes the steel specification and thickness for both the head and the shell of the vessel. The next page includes a listing of all vessel connections, including the size, grade, and schedule of the nozzle. The manufacturer's certified drawing is another key document to have on file for materials of construction. As mentioned earlier, no two systems or high pressure receivers are identical. So as it pertains to the PNID, each diagram should be specific to the vessel. 
Most high pressure receiver PNIDs will include some or all of the following, a site column with isolation and purge valves, a king valve, the condenser drain isolation valve, a relief valve assembly, an equalizer line connecting the high pressure receiver to the high stage discharge pipe. The liquid injection cooling isolation valve would only be necessary for systems that utilize compressors that are liquid injection cooled. As it relates to high pressure receivers, there are a number of safety systems and other appurtenances to be aware of. The liquid level indicator is an important accessory to any high pressure receiver as it allows an operator to verify the level in the vessel. The type displayed here is called a bullseye column and consists of numerous circular sight glasses that are welded to a carbon steel pipe. This type of level column provides excellent protection against physical impact. This image displays the armored glass style of level column, which consists of a solid glass tube protected by steel on all sides. The glass tube level column in this instance is unsafe and dangerous, as it could be easily broken by physical impact. Unfortunately, there are some vessels that still use this type of level column. The king valve is another important feature of a high pressure receiver. Typically, an HPR will be configured with a single king valve that can be closed to stop the flow of ammonia from the vessel. This valve must be clearly labeled to aid first responders during an emergency. Some king valves must be manually operated, but in this image, the king valve is a solenoid valve so that it can be activated remotely. While not very common, some systems do not have a single king valve, but rather multiple valves that supply various areas of the system. In this instance, there are six valves that must be closed to stop the flow of ammonia from the high pressure receiver. Relief valves are the most recognizable safety device associated with a high pressure receiver. Due to the size of most HPRs, the vessel will be equipped with a dual relief assembly consisting of a three-way valve and two relief valves, one of which is protecting the vessel at any given moment. All pressure vessels must be equipped with a legible nameplate provided by the manufacturer. The nameplate must be permanently affixed to the vessel and contain at least the following, an ASME stamp, the certified manufacturer's name, the serial number, the national board number, the year that the vessel was built, and the pressures and temperatures that we discussed earlier. Unfortunately, missing or corroded nameplates are a common vessel deficiency. When this occurs, care must be taken to improve legibility or obtain a replacement nameplate. We'll now turn our attention to the design codes and standards that must be adhered to during the design, installation, and operation of a high pressure receiver. Namely, we'll consider unique requirements for pressure vessels in IIAR's design standard, standard two. Then we'll examine the installation requirements in standard four. Finally, we'll address the inspection, testing, and maintenance requirements in IIAR standard six. Let's start with IIAR standard two which addresses the design of an ammonia refrigeration system. We'll examine the items listed on the screen, which are requirements in chapter 12 of standard two. As it pertains to the design of any pressure vessel, the minimum design pressure must comply with an earlier section of the standard, section 5.5. Most ammonia refrigeration systems are water or evaporatively cooled, so the pertinent requirements are items two and three. To summarize the requirements, all high pressure receivers must have a minimum design pressure of at least 250 PSIG. However, in especially hot climates, the design pressure may need to be higher to accommodate the highest 1% wet bulb temperature or the highest design leaving condensing water temperature. Vessels with an internal volume of less than 10 cubic feet may have a three quarter inch relief valve connection, while vessels greater than 10 cubic feet must have a connection of at least one inch for the relief valve assembly. Section 12.2.4 requires that the heads of pressure vessels be stress relieved after cold forming. Vessels used primarily for oil containment are exempt from this requirement. The high pressure receiver's minimum design metal temperature or MDMT must be lower than the lowest expected operating temperature. Most high pressure receivers have an MDMT of minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Where a vessel may be susceptible to corrosion, a suitable means must be used to protect the vessel. To address this requirement, Appendix A of Standard 2 recommends painting, insulation, cathodic protection, corrosion control gel, or similar products. The addition of a corrosion allowance may be required to meet the life expectancy of a particular pressure vessel installation. All ammonia
ammonia refrigeration pressure vessels must be tested in accordance with ASME Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code, Section 8, Division 1. Standard 2 requires that vessels be designed with a nameplate consisting of the information that we have shown previously in this video. The nameplate must be permanently affixed to the vessel. High pressure receivers are typically uninsulated, but many controlled pressure receivers are. When this is the case, the nameplate must be installed with a standoff to ensure it is not covered by insulation. Moving on, let's dig into the high pressure receiver installation requirements in IIAR Standard 4. Section 4.8 requires that all equipment be positioned to ensure clearance is provided for accessibility and service requirements. Furthermore, the vessel must be protected from both physical and environmental damage. When installed outdoors, equipment must be in a restricted location and have a means of preventing unauthorized access. As it relates to supporting and anchoring a high pressure receiver, any threaded fasteners must be completely engaged. The nut on the right is an example that is not fully engaged. Additionally, expanded concrete anchors must not be spun after they have been set in concrete. The requirements on this page are applicable to all ammonia refrigeration equipment. The final two items do not pertain to high pressure receivers. Here's a quick rundown of the requirements. All equipment must be anchored and secured. When equipment is suspended, double nut fasteners must be employed. Foundations and supports must be non-combustible and designed for the load they will carry. Foundations and supports must not impede drainage to floor drains. Equipment must be mounted to prevent excessive vibration. Electrical equipment must conform to the National Electric Code. For pressure vessels, this would apply to any float switches or solenoid valves. Now let's turn our attention to the inspection, testing, and maintenance, or ITM, requirements for high pressure receivers. These requirements are contained in Chapter 10 of IIAR Standard 6. All non-insulated pressure vessels must be visually inspected annually to identify pitting and surface damage. Here's an example of a vessel with extensive surface corrosion and pitting. IIAR 6 also requires that metal surfaces on sight glasses be visually inspected for pitting or surface damage. Here's an example of corrosion on a bullseye column that must be arrested. Controlled pressure receivers are often insulated, so the requirement to visually inspect the vessel insulation for signs of failure would be applicable. Using a thermal imaging camera is helpful to identify insulation system failure that is not visible to the naked eye. There is a requirement later in the table, item J, which requires visual inspection of the protective jacketing for cracks and holes. It is suggested that all insulation related inspections be completed together. High pressure receivers should be painted. During the annual inspection, the vessel must be inspected to identify areas where the paint has deteriorated. Here's an example of minor paint degradation. The next set of requirements pertain to the vessel foundation, anchorage, and supports. Typically, high pressure receivers are ground mounted with anchor bolts embedded into the concrete foundation. Here's a unique example where the vessel is raised on a concrete pier but still anchored to the foundation. Special attention should be made to ensure the foundation is not cracking as displayed in this image. The next requirement in IIAR 6 is to semi-annually inspect the vessel for excessive vibration or movement when liquid is being supplied to the vessel. This requirement is most relevant to surge drums that receive liquid through a solenoid valve. For HPRs, the high pressure liquid supplied by the condenser should not be a cause of any vibration. IIAR 6 also requires nameplates to be visually inspected annually to ensure they are legible and attached. We've discussed nameplates a couple of times already in this video, so there is not a need to go into details here. As it relates to the testing of a high pressure receiver, the first two requirements are inspection dependent. That means that they need not be performed unless an inspector identifies significant corrosion that requires non-destructive testing and measurement of the remaining wall thickness. Often, the wall thickness of a non-insulated vessel is measured using an ultrasonic thickness gauge and then the data collected can be analyzed to calculate the remaining wall thickness. For pitting, a tool called a pit gauge can be used to measure the depth of a single pit. For insulated vessels, such as controlled pressure receivers, insulation removal for evaluation and testing is also inspection dependent. 
Here's an example of an insulated CPR that was stripped to facilitate thorough examination after showing signs of insulation system failure. The final testing requirements for pressure vessels are to test and calibrate liquid level controls and to test liquid level float switches. Often, high pressure receivers are not configured with such controls and switches, so these tests would not be applicable. Occasionally, however, an HPR will have a level indicating probe or float switch. When that is the case, the tests are required annually. IIAR6 has two maintenance requirements for pressure vessels. First, oil must be drained as needed. Oil typically collects in vessels on the low side of the system, so this is rarely required for high pressure receivers. The second and final requirement is to calibrate all level control functions that are integral to safety shutdowns where applicable. For example, if the level probe in this image were interlocked to shut off liquid injection cool compressors if the level dropped too low, the requirement on the previous slide would apply. This concludes our video on high pressure receivers. I trust you found the information useful. We have more videos on our channel about ammonia refrigeration and process safety management. Feel free to check them out if you're interested.